basically what we are doing here. Now, this is Final Thoughts Evangelion. So once we say the word, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. And normally a lot of people, when they don't care about a show, say, yeah, I don't care. Just spoil the show for me. In fact, when it came to Shoujo Kakame Utena, multiple people had asked me over the years to spoil the show, and I refused to. No. And when Emily finally saw the show all the way through, she thanked me for not spoiling it. And all I want to say is that if you have not seen Neon Genesis Evangelion all the way through, do not listen any further. This show is so incredibly worth your watching. And if you're one of those people out there, I know you exist, right? Who has not watched the whole show seriously, given watched every single episode in order with your full attention, or maybe you've never watched any of it, and you have all the sorts of uh, misgivings about it, or... Or, if you saw it while you were a teenager, or a young 20-something, watch it again when you're older. Get the DVD box set, the platinum DVD box set. It's like set 30 is, bucks. It's stupidly cheap. It comes with the entire TV series and four director's cut versions of episodes 21 through 24, I think, right? Watch the whole thing again. So, or for the first time. And I don't care if you're one of those people who's like, I don't like robots. Or I don't give a shit. Watch yes, it. Even if you hated Ava. You listen to us. You watch it again. You watch it four more times and you still hate it. In the end, that's fine. It's kind of like Citizen Kane. You just, you just. Yeah, but you can, <laughs> you can, you can say, I do not like Citizen Kane. And while a lot of people will say, wow, you have some bad taste in movies. At the same time, you, they can at least say, but it is your opinion. As long as you admit that Citizen Kane is an important movie, a well-constructed movie, an amazing mm -hmm. movie. I mean, like, you might look at, say, I don't know, the Sistine Chapel and say, you know, I'm not really feeling anything. I'm just looking at it, and I got no feelings coming in, you know? That's so, fine. At, you know, I don't like different, you. Different, you know, different strokes and folks and all that business, right? But uh, um, <laughs> all that made me think of was the opening scene of the stupid Ava movie. Well, it made me think of different strokes, the TV show. Well, one stroke <laughs> for some folk. Right. All over some other folk. To, no, which, to, no, which, but... to which my mom said, what are you watching? We don't need this business. Okay. I keep that business out of here. Okay. But uh, if you yeah, you can't say uh, the Sistine Chapel sucks. No, it's, it's pretty much like the best ever. And if, if you don't like it, you're, you're dumb. Yes. But basically, this is Final Thoughts Evangelion. But I'm going to have to clarify that because there is a lot to Evangelion. So we could probably just sit here and talk all night and not run out of things to say. So we're basically going to, it's, it's the one hour of thoughts about Evangelion. Yes. So it is going to be, however, a final thoughts episode. We're going, there, nothing is sacred, spoilers all over the place. But I want to say that this episode is almost more, I would almost want to call it in defense of Evangelion. I don't think it needs defense. Why would you need to? It's like, well, who needs to defend Citizen Kane? Well, the reason it needs to be defended is because unlike Citizen Kane, imagine if you went online and there were entire websites dedicated to people ranting about how much Citizen Kane sucks. I think there might be. Let me search right While now. While you search for that, because I see that with Ava. A lot of otherwise intelligent people will come up to me and try to tell me that Ava is a terrible show. And yet, I've never heard a well-reasoned oh, argument. The top result for Hate Citizen Kane, right, is, check, here's a quote from it. Despite the fact that I can respect and appreciate its significance in cinematic history based uh, solely uh, on entertainment uh, value, I hate Citizen Kane. Uh, that is exactly what opinion you were allowed to have. Exactly. But I feel like the reason we don't need to defend Evangelion, like Scott said, is because, well, like, one of the lessons I've learned from both Gekiga and Haki, the best defense is a strong offense. Yes, we've already begun to make fun of the people who hate, hate Evangelion, and I can tell you, we will not stop doing so. So what Especially, is... Especially, I mean, before my most recent viewing, I might have said, yeah, you know, I know why people don't like the show. It's sort of weird and tries to be existential and could be interpreted as pretentious. Yes, I a believe... A lot of people don't like the heavy metaphor action. You know? I believe when we watched Big O2, mm. I said the words in the Big O2 final thoughts, this show did the end of Ava better than Ava. And you know what? I retract that statement. 100%. The final two episodes of Ava are brilliant. Yeah, if you... Brilliant! I watch Ava again, and now I say, no, 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 no longer am I gonna say I understand why people don't like the end of this. Well, I guess I do understand. 
You're, you, you have, you're, your brain is broken. You're wrong. <laughs> you're an idiot. But basically... You, have, you, have, you don't have no taste. You have no tongue. What this show is, what we're going to do very specifically, is tell you everything we think. Even though we've already killed like a whole bunch of time not saying anything. That's fine. Well, because this is, it's, this is one of those difficult... We are in very dangerous waters here. We are treading deeper. That's okay, because we brought a whole boatload of ammo. Oh, my God, And yes. you know what they'll listen to, Rim? Reason? That's right. Or an AT field. <laughs> no, they'll listen to Reason. You know what's great? <laughs> I'll, here's my one fanboy moment. Reason wouldn't have done shit to even Ava 00. No, not at all. <laughs> 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 all right, that's enough Thunderdome. Okay, but, that's enough Thunderdome. But what we're doing... Is we're talking about the show, Shin Seiki Evangelion, Neon Genesis Evangelion, episodes 1 through 26. As you would see them if you buy the Platinum Collection, pretty much as they were seen by people on TV. And we're not going to talk about anything that is not in that. In TV in Japan. Yes, and the reason I say that is because there's a lot you can say about Evangelion that is not able to be determined from the show. You could only know these things... If you saw the movies, if you read the books, listen to interviews with Anno, and all these things really color the show, and we're not talking about that. Uh, We could do a whole separate show on, like, interpretations of Ava. We're not talking about how to interpret Ava. We're talking about what is in Ava. So thus, at this point, the Spear Mm -hmm. of Longanus is going right through that spoiler line. Mm -hmm. Once again, I beseech you, if you have not seen Evangelion all the way through, or you don't remember what it's about... Do, or if you watched it and you kind of liked it, but you haven't watched it in a long time. Do not listen any further. Come back after you've watched Ava all the way through. Yeah. So, that said, Ava is a show about the end of the world. And that might sound like a very trite thing to say. I mean, yeah, Ava's the show where they kill everyone yeah. at the end, and they're not kidding. <laughs> well, and I there's mean, a lot of shows about the end of the think world. Think about how many, right, anime, manga especially, but sci-fi things in general, right? Maybe they're post-apocalyptic, and the world already ended, and now it's the few people left over who are still, you know, struggling to survive and, you know, make their way in, in, a, in a doomed land. Or maybe it's one of those shows where okay, there's something horrible attacking, and if the good guys lose, it will be the end of the world. But, you know, it's just mostly a a big fighting show, sort of like, I don't know, uh, Project Blue, Cheeky SOS, right? Or something like that, right? Or it could be one of those shows... Well, there's like the last question, you know, science fiction that deals with these topics, but Ava, what it does, it does something that has been done before. It's not like Ava is the only work of fiction to ever do this, but... The gravity of the situation and the gravity of what, I mean, it is the end of the world and the gravity is presented to you in such stark relief in this show. It is handled so well. Well, because what most of those other shows do, especially the ones that are, you know, have the risk of end of world situation is it's basically if something happens that barely anyone knows is happening, then the world will end pretty much near instantly. Evangelion is... Everyone, pretty much the whole world, knows it's coming. They know the chances of the world. It's not one of those things where there's a chance the world could end. It's like there's a chance it maybe could not end, maybe, but no, it's probably gonna end. And it's yeah, let me think die. of this: the characters in the show, the characters we are, you know, experiencing this world through their eyes. That these people, Masato, Shinji, all, they know that the world is ending. That's it. They're they're and all it's they're happening. Doing, it's not happening quickly. It's happening over the course of many, many, many days. They have a lot of time to think about this. And the it's whole world like, knows it too. No, it's not like it's this big. Well, it's, it's somewhat secret, but it's not super secret. Well, it's kind of like early on in the show, the world isn't a hundred. Like they, you know, they know something's going on, and but the, you know, the moment God sent His angels to end the world, and all nerve is is kind of humanity's last ditch like there's a tiny chance we might not all yeah. die it's basically big monsters are coming out of the sky trying to destroy the world and the humans see them it's kind of hard to hide a big giant monster and they're uh they're using all of the science of man to try to uh fight it off and uh they're barely making it now of course part of what makes the show the gravity so powerful and makes the show so powerful is that Basically, they don't win. I mean, you've seen the end of Ava. A lot of people joke and say, yeah, everyone dies. But no, think about that. It's not just a kill them all to me. Everyone dies. Everyone, everything, existence, 
Everything ends. It's over. Nothing exists. It's done. That's it. Think about that. Think about what that entails. Well, the thing that really gets me is not so much that everyone dies at the end, because there's a lot of shows where everyone dies at the end. It's that, or at least everyone you care about dies. Yes, at the but end. it's not just that. It's everyone. Yeah. But it's um it's that during the show, right? The people in the world actually act as if it's the end of the world, at least more so than in anything else I can think of. Any other, uh, you know, story in, in any medium that, you know, comes to mind. Right. I mean, there's this town that's the one city, even though it's a highly defensible city where all the mo- or all the, you know, crazy monsters are attacking. So people all move away from that city. And then, you know, like the, the U.N. stop the humanity they use. Right. I mean, think about this. Right. When you're in every day to day life, even of the real world right now. Right. You know, governments around the world, they make decisions about how many resources to allocate towards different things. You play a game like Civilization, right? You decide how many resources towards science, how many towards defense, how many towards these different things, right? In this situation, you actually have the entire world expending 100% of its resources to stop the pretty much unstoppable end of the world because if it's really the end and it's really horrible monsters attacking and you don't have you know some mystical voltron that just comes out of nowhere for free you're gonna spend every single dollar every single person every single thing you've got for any chance that you can find and the world does that now now at this point i mean we really i want to talk about because a concept and a plot alone are not what can make something great. Because as Neil Gaiman always says, the idea is nothing. Everyone has ideas. Doing it is what matters. Yeah, because people and, would always write to Neil Gaiman, like, I have this great idea for a story. Do you want to write it with me? You know, and Neil Gaiman's like, listen, your idea isn't worth anything. Everyone has a million ideas, right? The only thing that's worth anything is not just your ability to turn that idea into something great, but actually doing it, your actual labor. You actually have to sit down, do it, and make it happen. And making it happen and ha- is what's worth something. But Ava does all of these things incredibly well and incredibly subtly. And I think it is my honest opinion that most of the people who have such an intense dislike for Evangelion really honestly, truly did not understand it and well, did not pay attention and really uh, don't exactly. know what it was about. I think that a big part of Evangelion that hurts a lot of people is that you know, you really, 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 more so than a lot of other things I could think of. Except Less, maybe so than books. Less so than Utena. Less so You have to pay attention with your conscious brain to every moment of it. There are significant, significant things where if you miss them, you won't know what the hell's going on. That will happen in like a second, real quick. Like someone will say something like, oh, such and such, or something will be in like the corner of a frame. And, you know, the, 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 that shot will be on screen for maybe five seconds. And if you didn't see it, you're missing something major in the show. And when people talk about it later, you'll be like, what the hell are they talking about? You have to pay attention to every single word and every single thing you see. And even, you know, I paid really close attention. And there were even some things where I had to rewind a little bit because I know I missed something. And if you don't do that, I can understand why you wouldn't get the show or think it was so great because you didn't see it. But even you then, missed it. no, you no, no. It. See, because even then, even if you don't understand all those kind of, you know, what was instrumentality and what exactly was happening... That's not the point of the show. I mean, that's I think that's what really trips people up, that the show was a bait and switch. It started as this Monster of the Week show, got a bunch of people watching it, and bit by bit, that's all stripped away like an onion. And then at the end, you're left with nothing. And the last two episodes very literally sit you down and say, look, none of that bullshit mattered at all. Here's what this show was about. And what it was about was brilliant, and I think the way it was portrayed mm-hmm. in the end was great. And I think a lot of people... Just, they didn't see the forest for the trees. They saw that end, and they didn't think about what that meant, about solipsism, about identity, about psychoses, about, uh, you know, humanity. They thought, but what happened to the giant robots? Yeah, because they were only understanding the show on a surface level. And they were just, you know, and it's it's not hard to understand how you could enjoy the show on the surface level because the show is, I mean, you know, people always talk about, you know, things being deep or things being shallow, right? And in reality, at least according to me, if you if something can only be enjoyed on the deep level, but on the surface level, it's crap. Or if something on the surface level is great, but has no depth to it, 
That's both crap. Good things are good from top to bottom. And Evangelion is good from top to bottom. That surface level robot show that's in the beginning, right? Fighting the monsters is one of the best surface level robot shows ever. Easily. Right? But at the same time, I think a lot of people, <laughs> they get hung up on very little details about the show. Like they see something and like they really wonder about these things. And they care so much about the minute kind well, of fanboy details yep. of the show that as a result, they can't see the wholeness of the work. They get so zoomed in about what, why did the guy in the yep. back of Sele well, say this the as reason, opposed to the other guy who said you know, this? Many, and what exactly was the room of golf? And oh my God, Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Many, Kabbalah. many, many shows and many books and many movies like to do a thing where they... They, they let you know that a secret exists. They're like, they'll say something, you know, that is um, sort of, or they'll present an enigma of some way, or they'll, they'll, show, they'll show you something visually, but not tell you or explain what it was you just saw in any way. They'll just show you something. And then you're left thinking, what was that? They showed it to me. It must be something. What was it? You know, it's a Chekhov's gun of some kind. And Evangelion shows you more stuff without explaining what it is right away than... Uh, think about how many things. It's like three or four things so far where I've said it does it more than anything else, right? Evangelion is harder, better, faster, stronger <laughs> than all the rest in every way. But at the same the time... The show has a lot of secrets, basically. The show does something really... I mean, th here's kind of the important part of what it is that makes Ava good. A lot of shows that try to be deep, the shows that people accuse of being pretentious sometimes are and the reason they are is that they don't actually have a lot to say or they can't say what they want to say well so they will hide behind layers of obscurity they will make things obtuse on purpose and they'll like they'll flash things on screen that just confuse you and that there was no way you could have figured them out but i'll say this if you watch ava and you're reasonably intelligent and you pay attention you and I mean pay attention to a reasonable level, not even to the Scott level. If you never rewind back, you just watch the show with your attention. You will get 95% of what happened, and yeah. you will be able to understand the wholeness of the show. I was incredibly surprised upon my most recent watching how many of the secrets are just plainly said exactly what the secret is. They just come out and say it. There was a whole episode where they basically tell you the past of everything, right? Where they show you, you know, all the adults and they were kids and everything. And I'm like, I totally forgot that episode even existed. But the episode basically tells you everything. It just spells it out and spills the beans right there in plain English. And I was left wondering, like, huh, I wonder why people always thought that the show was so hard to figure out. They're pretty much telling you everything. There are even early episodes where they just come out with stuff like, oh, yeah, this, by the way. You know, I always thought the reveal of the, you know, Ava's being, you know, biological was in, you know, that later episode where Ava Zero One goes crazy. No, and it's starts in episode idiot. two. It's in episode two. Episode two, they reveal they're biological because the armor falls off of Ava One's face and it's got like the crazy jaw in there. All right, speaking of that, I think we should talk a little bit it's about just spelled out the, the, the specific things like why we say this because i mean I, we can't go into every detail someday i want to do a clip panel where i show these things because i went to this great lecture at emily's school you know nyu a while ago and the, the professor did a lecture about citizen kane and what he did is he would show like he'd say you know the show did this symbolism and then he would show you all the scenes where it was done then he'd say it's poignant and relevant because they use these camera angles to do this effect. And then he'd show you the scenes and he'd say, and he'd pause it and say, look at that. Look how the camera is on this scene, but it's focused on this character and not this character. The focus of the lens is on this background character. Why? Because of X, Y, Z. And then he would back up all these points. You could do a series of lectures on Ava. And I, I'm going to say this. I believe that Ava is so well put together that it would handily stand up to that level of, I guess, dissection and that level of analysis by PhDs in film. Easily. Easily. I, I, it's I, not even like a, a contest. And I, I would love to see someone like that analyze Ava that way, partly because I don't think I have the time or the effort or the knowledge to pull it off. But, like, what does Ava do? Like, I want to... Let's talk a little bit about sound. Ava's soundtrack... and well, No, not soundtrack. Soundscape is amazing. Ooh. Well, because it's not just the music. The music is very important. Notice how the music changes throughout the show. There are themes in the show, like the happy Misato theme, the everyone's hanging out, you know, in yeah, Misato's they stopped house. using that one. <laughs> Songs appear. They have, like, characters have leitmotifs, and they come and go, but 
yeah. a lot of those light motifs disappear. The tone of the show changes as it goes on. And if you went through the show, like there, are, you can point out the exact moment, I guess, where the music died, where the laughter <laughs> died, where you hear a song and see a scene, and you could say definitively that music is never played again. A scene like that never happens again. In fact, there's a point at which you can say there is not a single joke, nor is there a moment of levity of any kind from this point forward until the end mm. of the show. This was the last <laughs> moment you could smile. This was the last joke. Yeah, I mean, early on in the show, right, it's, it, you know, even though there's some weird stuff going on, fighting aliens, chance at the end of the world, weird stuff, right? There's some jokes. You've got Masato getting drunk, acting silly. Asuka you, and Shinji bicker with each Asuka other. Asuka and Shinji fighting with each other. That you, episode where they do the music and they basically play DDR and dance that and fight That episode is directed by the guy who uh, directed Full Metal Alchemist by the way yes and that episode <laughs> and you can sort out. of tell but that episode stands out as being amazing and all these things the show starts out with a like you know 40 percent humor and then you know 60 percent everything else well it's, it's not humor fun it's yes. you know it's it, there's sort of normal everyday anime kind of stuff going on some of the time maybe 30 40 percent of the and time even when poignant thing hap things happen there is a little bit of levity you know you know it, it's kind of the idea that the show builds up tension, and then there is release. And it builds up tension, and then there is release. But the show does something clever. And I could point to a thousand examples of this, where in the beginning, the show builds up, say, five tension points. And then eventually, you know, it drops. It's kind of like opening parentheses and closing parentheses when you're writing code. It'll open five, then close two, then open one more, but then it closes them all again. You get release. But as the show goes on, it, it'll start, end, like, episodes will end without all the tension being released. And then the next episode, like more tension is introduced, but even less is released. And there's a point at which they just stop releasing. Like altogether. seriously, like the mm. Scott says that, but no, literally there's a point in the show at which there is no more release at all until yeah. the last, it until to... the last one minute and five seconds of the show, give or take like up until that point, there are like a six episode span where there is no release at all. Yeah, it's like, oh, fight a nasty robot, get freaked out. Oh, but we're now we're in school. All right. All right. It's cool. At the we're end, hanging it's in school. Fight a nasty right. robot, get freaked out, not even be happy. I mean, remember when Shinji stops? He kills Kaoru. You know, the la the well, the second to last, the last angel, whatever. Like he feels bad about it. He wins. He kills it. The next, you know, the the next scene that you see is not hooray we won it's shinji saying i should have died it shouldn't have been him i feel nothing the world is yeah. dead basically <laughs> he starts they start carrying over the uh you know the craziness of the previous episodes into the next one but like it, it's not just you know early on it's like okay they carry over episode one into episode two okay but then as you go on, it is monster of the week and the monster is only there for the week. And then once they get rid of the monster, you know, it's like, OK, whew, all right, we beat that monster. But later in the show, the monsters are in. Are, well, they I remain. was going to say, you know, Ray gets, Ray gets injured. She remains injured for a significant amount of time. Shinji gets sucked into that weird other dimension. He's fucked up for like two episodes. But it's not just that. Then Asuka, when she's fucked up, she's fucked up for the entire rest of the show. She's done. But here's the thing. The show, like I was going to say, it's kind of cliche that, you know, the monsters remain. But no, the monsters remain because they're in the heads of the characters. But you've seen the end of the show. And I think it's safe to say the monsters are the characters. Yeah. It's like the characters themselves are it. And the show just... Like, you know, that scene where Shinji says, I should have died, not him. And there's no release of the tension. Even then, what does Masato sh say? She doesn't say it's all right. She doesn't comfort Shinji. She basically says, no, you were right to kill him. And then he says that you're cold. You're a cold person. And then it ends. <laughs> there's no release at all. And the show starts getting uncomfortable to watch. And part of that uncomfortableness, I think, is because... As kind of the world is stripped away and as the show becomes more and more about the characters and their motivations because there's nothing left in the show, 
you start to get uncomfortable because you identify with the characters and you don't want to because you hate them. Well, you have to be uncomfortable in that kind of situation because you're in the city where the giant horrible aliens that no one understands are attacking this spot for some reason, right? Trying to, and if they win, it's the end of the world. You're a very small group of people, the only people who can possibly save the world, and everyone else, everyone you know, you know, which is pretty much the happy people that, you know, were somewhat normal at least, all moved away. There's no one there. You're all alone in this horrible base, you know, with these horrible robots and machines, and it's quiet and scary and mysterious, and, you know, you're just waiting away the days until either you lose and the world ends... Or you save it, and then what? You're fucked up from the experience. But even then... That, it's, like, like, it's it's even worse than waiting in the, in the mall for the zombies to eat everybody. Get back to the structure, because again, that idea is not new and not special in and of itself, but Ava just does it so well, because... They make you feel like the people there. I mean, if you watch Dawn of the Dead, you know, I don't really feel so much like the people in the mall, you know, as much as maybe... I could. In Ava, well, they, I, I think I feel worse than the people. But what it is, is they force it on you in a very subtle way. I mean, the beginning of the show, and watch, n notice how background characters are rarely drawn in a generic style. They're often, the background characters you see in the beginning of the show are often unique characters. Someone pointedly drew them all to be different, to stand out as different. And the show goes a long way, for one, to show that all of humanity is kind of working together, but two... It goes out of its way to show you all the side characters. You see all like there's a scene where they're like putting together in an early episode one of the plugs to plug into an Ava for something. And they show you like 60 or 70 engineers and scientists and workmen and laborers and janitors all over the place working on this. You see all these people everywhere. You cut to the city, you see cars, you see people yeah, in shops. The episode you overhear the, uh... now. This is the important thing. You overhear a lot of conversations of side characters. People are talking, speaking lines. That totally goes away bit by bit. And then you realize towards the end of the show that you haven't seen anyone at all but a very tiny subset of main characters for much of the end yeah, of the show. Yeah, and the episode where the power goes out, right? And uh, Gendo is there with all these engineers, like, you know, turning cranks on everything to make everything work because with all the manual backups and everything. Later on, it's basically like... Six people at a computer, and there's no one else around. You know, they walk around this gigantic, gigantic, gigantic underground base, and early in the show, it'd be like they'd walk around the base, and there'd be other people walking around the base, opening the doors up and down the escalators. Now, they're always alone in the elevator. Whenever they're in an elevator, if someone else comes in the elevator, it's always another one of the characters. You only ever see the characters. Everyone else is gone. And even when people there are people who aren't the characters that come in you know the main characters that do come into play at that point in the show there's an episode where you know oscar runs away and someone goes to and they uh like un or some spy guys go and find her but notice how now these characters they don't show you that guy they're that, all faceless they're if they have a voice the guy is generic. completely off screen you see his shadow and you only see oscar and even the guys in Sele, they become sound only and you never see them again. That, I mean, that is one of those brilliant things as to what makes Ava, like, the subtlety that is there. I mean, look, early on, you know Sele is not there. When the Sele got the old man, who, by the way, if you're, if you're looking to read things into the show, they're Jewish. <laughs> now, 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 just seriously, <clears throat> think about that for a minute and think <clears throat> about Judeo-Christian mythology, but I'll get back to that later. <laughs> so, but they meet via these video conferences and the way those scenes are put together are amazing. But then, as Scott pointed out, as all the characters, all the people who aren't the main characters, all the excuses, every excuse the characters have to not face the monsters inside themselves, to not face themselves, to pretend that other people are around and therefore they can just keep living their lives and they won't have to confront everything that they really are because there's no one left in the world. There's a, that very pointed moment where you see Sele again, and there is no longer Sele. It is just big black monoliths, sound only. You stop seeing their faces. Mm. And that's not just allegory. It's not just color. It's not just this subtle shift toward alienation and toward forcing people who are alone to confront themselves. It has very literal meaning as to what's going on at the end yeah. of the show. Yeah, Sele. Where are they? What are they doing? Yeah, why is Sele sound only? They were holograms before. What happened? 
It's because they went somewhere where they can only have sound and there's no cameras to, you know, make the holograms anymore. Now, if you pay attention to what's going on in the show, you know, this is going to be it's one on, of those. They just tell you straight up where they went. Yes. Notice how they were creating the Ava series. It's obvious. Like, it, it's really obvious that they are all in the Ava series for whatever thing that is they're going to do at the end of the world. Because yeah, remember, you know, Sele's talking about how, oh, they really want to finish this, you know, production series of, uh, of Ava's, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, notice that if you ever have watched, you know, you're not going to know this because you're not talking about episode, the alternate ep air, right? But, um... Yes, because remember, they, well, now we'll talk about this Even just watching the TV show, they're piloting that production series. That's where they went. They're all inside Ava's elsewhere. And that's why there's no holograms of them. But along with that sense of alienation, you know, I'd mentioned the soundscape and then I left it, but... Aside from the light motifs and the music and the wonderful use they use, the way they use major, minor, or dissonant or augmented chords as their own kind of like, like there are the light motifs, but within those songs, these different chords really jarringly like set the mood in different ways. But it's also the sound effects. You know that sound of the cicadas that you yeah, hear? People all the don't time? realize it, I didn't catch this until the most recent watching, right? But there was a second impact in the, you know, way back when, right? The second impact was this, you know, giant explosion in at Antarctica. Most people on Earth think it was a, you know, they tell them the story that it was a meteor that hit Antarctica. Yeah, but Nerve knows even that it wasn't. was basically Masato's dad who did that. Basically, yeah. Um, and, you know, Antarctica melted, basically. And there's, you know, it's like global warming times a billion. And it's always summer. And the thing is, when I watched it back in the day, I sort of missed that fact that it was always summer. I, it, it's not, it's, it's easy to miss that. But if you're a Japanese person, you know, cicadas are big there in the summer. So hearing cicadas all the time, constant reminder that it's summer, constant reminder that, you know, there's the worst global warming, Antarctica melted. There was a huge, like, you know, pre-apocalypse many years ago and, and this it's, it's is still used. always summer this is used to great effect i mean they taught they mentioned briefly later the room of golf which is this old like jewish jewish mysticism thing and there's a lot of ways to read into it but it's the idea that in the heavens i guess technically in like the six like one of the specific heavens that i don't know a lot about this stuff but there is the idea that all souls originate from this place and the messiah the end of the world cannot come and will not come until that room is empty, until the last soul is born into the world. And there's a separate myth, part of that, that the sounds of grasshoppers or the sounds of certain insects or the sounds of certain, you know, things in the environment are the sound that you hear when souls come out of this room or in this room. And the cicadas are used in this very subtle way to allude to that, but they're also used as a light motif. Because you hear them in the background in certain kinds of scenes, usually to express alienation, emptiness, loneliness, the fact that the world is empty and dying and there's nothing left. Yeah. And then there's more to it than that. There are a lot of subtle little references where someone, I think Masato, you know, they say there's a very, there's like a 0% chance that this is going to succeed or a very low chance that this thing will succeed. And Masato says... Yeah, but there's a chance it'll snow tomorrow. And if you didn't remember or realize or think that it's summer all the time, that it's never going to snow again, that statement just sounds like, yeah, and pigs will fly, but it's actually, there's a lot more to it. And it's subtle and meaningful. And it's really easy to miss that stuff. But I don't want to, you know, go into every detail because I don't want to spend the whole show pointing them all out. But the show is full of references like that. Yeah, and, and because, you know, it's not, I mean, it's not the real world. There aren't really giant aliens and robots and all sorts of crazy shit like that. But it's, other than that, it's, you know, real human beings on Earth in Japan and Tokyo number whatever, right? Tokyo three or four, right? Because, uh, you know, you can never get enough Tokyos. Um, and, you know, the things that they talk about are, are plain English. It's not like loaded with proper nouns as much as, you know, say the Prince of Nothing is. And it's real easy for, you know, things they say for you to interpret them as per the real world because using real world, real world words. But really, in that universe, which, you know, they don't go and explain like all the details of the universe like a lot of fantasy kind of books will do, you know. So you'll miss out that it actually means something different in that world because of the way things are and because of the situation they're in. And if you didn't pay attention, you don't get it and you think they said something else that they didn't say. 
But uh, I want to go back a little bit because Scott mentioned the episode where the power's out and everyone's kind of scrapping together. This episode has perhaps my favorite comedic moment in the entire show because, you know, we're talking about all the reasons the show is good indeed and like the, how well put together it is. But the shallow parts are really well put together too. I mean, the fight scenes are amazingly well choreographed and everything is great. But that scene where, you know, there's no air conditioning, it's hot, it's dark, there's no power, everyone's in their uniforms, you know, doing their work. And someone remarks that, yeah, we have to, you know, it's hot and this sucks, but we have to pull through. Look at them. Look how cool and collected they are. And it cuts up to, you see, Gendo and Fuyutsuki. Gendo's sitting there with his, you know, that pose that he always has. And he looks totally cool and collected, and he's not showing any discomfort at all. And Fuyutsuki's standing there, and he's just like, they're in charge. They're in command. And it cuts very briefly to a back shot of them. And you see that both of them are in their uniforms from the waist up. But they totally have their pants off and their feet are in buckets of ice water. Yeah, it's a, that was good <laughs> it stuff. Just, and or like um, when they get the, the super sniper rifle to take out that early angel. And basically Misato shows up at that research lab and she's like, yeah, we're here to take all your shit. Hee <laughs> hee. And then she says, all right, Ray. And Ray just rips the roof off the, off the stupid warehouse and reaches yeah. in. And they don't show you any of this, but she says, now be careful, that's an incredibly delicate piece of machinery. And you immediately hear nothing but like 20 seconds of crashing and horrible destruction as she rips this thing out of the building. And I just thought that was really funny. It is really funny. And in the, in the episode with the laser even, right? It's like the show is all about the gravity of everything. You know, it's like... We're giving you all the electricity in Japan to fire this laser. Literally. Literally. And, you know, at first, you know, you can interpret that as sort of like a silly thing that happens in robot shows. But in this show, because it, it's not presented, as, you know, like, it's just the animation style of it alone does a good enough job of, you know, not making it seem like a Messenger Z. You yeah, know? I mean, how much of that episode <laughs> is dedicated to shots of thousands and thousands of people doing work. They cut to all the infrastructure. The amazing, like, you step back and think how absolutely amazing and awe-inspiring it would be for humans to pull something like that off. The sheer number of people, the man hours, the effort, mm -hmm. and the fact that it barely works. And it, the show does such a good job of expressing to you the gravity of the situation. And it does this time and time again. And it uses amazing just like shots and sounds and techniques to like convey it in every possible way where you can't miss it. And in the, pa the Power Goes Out episode again, you know, everything has a manual backup. It's so like perfect every, you know, every single, you know, you look around a lot of mecha design, right? And a lot of mecha design has lots and lots of little crazy details all over it, you know, like little hatches and doors and things like that, right? And Ava, the, the, the mechanical design has some of that going on. But really, actually, all those little details, you know, usually you'll see like a robot have like a million things all over it. And most of them are just decoration. And Ava, all the million things everywhere... Right? It's actually stuff that you can sort of, if you sat there, you could be like, oh, well, that's that, and that's that. And, you know, they actually draw the stuff like it's going to be used, and it is used. Yeah, I mean, the, it's the difference between uh, Gundam Seed and the Fire the Low and Greens, and they basically just throw in proper nouns, and they make themselves consistent, but it doesn't really matter. But in Ava, all these details that they present to you are self-consistent and matter on at least a shallow level, but in many cases on a much deeper level too, on a metaphorical level. Not just mecha design, but characters too. Yeah. Uh, uh. There's just, there's so much there. I mean, I could spend forever talking about specific scenes that like really moved me. Like, I, I think the scene, this scene, every time I see it, it gives me, gives me chills. There are two scenes, more so than anything in the show, that just, like, I get a chill when I see them. And one I really want to mention is just, Remember the angel that actually gets into the command center. Shinji doesn't want to pilot the robot. It breaks down the wall. Misato is standing there face to face with this angel. It is about to kill her. It is about to kill everyone. The world is going to end. It is over. And Shinji, who didn't want to fight, suddenly finds the will after that, again, 
amazing conversation with Kaji and the watermelons. And I could go on and on about Oh, Kaji and his watermelons. Oh, my God. And but Kaji's like one of the best parts of the show, period. But the scene where it breaks in and the angel, this alien thing, lumbers forward and looks them in the eye. And Masha- Masato looks it in the eye. And especially knowing what she went through as a child and what she is and why she's the way she is. And the, the amount of hate that is in her heart for these angels. And just that whole scene and the music and the sounds and everything is amazing. And I literally, like, I get a chill every time I see that scene. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you have any Ava scenes? Ava scenes? Oh, like, man. equally, equally big, equal chill is when the Ava goes berserk near the end of the show and everyone finds out what it is as it eats that angel and incorporates the S2 engine into itself. Yeah, that's a pretty typical scene. Yes, but the, the, <laughs> partly because the sounds, the Ava, like, the sounds the Ava makes are some, like, they're dist- they're really disturbing. They really, really get under your skin, and they're frightening, and they set the scene so well. One of the things that always gets me is the, you know, the there's the episode where Shinji sort of, um, he gets sent to, like, the, uh, the what's it called? The, like, the other dimension? What the fuck they call it? Oh, 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 yes, the uh, Shira- Dirac space. Oh, he, gets, he, gets, he gets stuck in the sea of Dirac, right? And then he comes back, and, like, he can't get out of the robot. He's stuck in there. And they're like, uh, he's not in there. Uh, yeah, it's just, just his suit floating in the, in the... Oh, I gotta talk about... I can't not talk about the... What's it? LHC? What's the LCL? Name? LCL, god damn All it. Right, this is another example of... People, this is an example of pay the fuck attention, right? The whole show is about LCL. LCL is the show. LCL is the show. If you don't realize that LCL is the show, you weren't paying attention, right? All right, so LCL is basically... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell it to you straight in case you weren't paying attention, right? And you've watched the show recently. LCL, when they get in the, in the AVA, right, the suit fills up with this yellow goop. Right? And then somehow they can breathe in it, and it works. Right? It's also the reason the Avas work. Right. LCL is basically, like, this chemical that is like... You know how metal conducts electricity? Well, LCL conducts souls, basically. And it's a cross between, like, I mean, metaphorically and literally in the show. And I mean that specific... Metaphorically and on the surface level. It's like a cross between primordial soup and amniotic fluid. Yep. And if you don't notice, when, you, when they're walking around Nerve and there's different doors that they open and things, you'll see stuff like LCL pool fa- this way, LCL factory And they show you scenes way. where, like, Ms. Ritsuko was clearly working with the LCL. She was diving in it. Yeah, and you look down, um, you know, in the... Uh, I guess that's in the movie, but... No, the, in Terminal Dogma, you yeah, see this. At the at the bottom, 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 right, in the in the... Bottomist terminal dogma, yes, terminal scary dogma, place where Adam. Oh, I'm sorry, Lilith yeah. is crucified. Adam slash Lilith is stuck on the cross with or without the Lancey Vlogging News, right? That's it's just it, the whole thing is just this endless sea of LCL, and that's what they make all of it. And look at it. All right, the it is crucified there. LCL is coming out of it. Yep. Where do the? Where do you think they're getting the LCL? And here's one more. Th- this is from the movie, but I can't not say it, right? At the end of the movie, it's famous because at the part where everyone dies, everyone sort of it just explodes, right? Like, boom. But it's not just they explode. They're it's- not exploding. They basically turning into LCL. They're not exploding with blood everywhere. And They're again, exploding into yellow goop. Literally. Literally. It is, they, they are LCL because we are LCL souls. And that's how the, the Human Instrumentality Project, which, you know, combining all human beings into one being... LCL is the mechanism for that. Everyone turns into LCL and there's a giant pool of yellow goop, literally, giant pool of yellow goop, and everyone's soul is transmitted in the yellow goop. One pool, now we're all one soul, we're one giant primordial ooze, that's it. That's, it's literally that. It's not, that's not some metaphor, that's what it is. Everyone turns into yellow goop, yep. there's a big pool of yellow goop. But anyway, uh, let's save until the very end of the show, because we can give a very mm. concise explanation, yellow in case goop. you still didn't get it, of, you know... <laughs> What happened? Because mm-hmm. I think it's pretty obvious, but it warrants discussion. But the scene you were talking about, because that is a very powerful scene. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Oh, I completely forgot. Yeah. Where uh, he's stuck in the Sea of Dirac, and then they can't get him out. And then there's all this whole thing where it's like, you know, yeah, there was someone else that we tried to get out, and it totally didn't work. And that was Shinji's mom and whatnot, and, you know, whatever. And then, like, at the end of that episode, he, like, pops out. And then the episode's over. And yes. it's just like, ah! 
Plus, and it's not the, the popping out that gets you. It's the episode over right away. It's a lot like that episode of Escaflone where the robot's bleeding and then over right away, end yep. the episode. Plus, that scene is so... I mean, the show does a really good job of having characters express real, raw, painful-to-watch emotion. I mean... The way Masato reacts to Shinji reappearing and the way she reacts to the fact that she thought he was gone, that is some powerful stuff. And even more powerful, the scene still to this day gets to me. When Masato finds out that Kaji is dead. Mm -hmm. And just the way and she... And how. And not, not just that how she finds out and that she finds out. And not just... The last words in that answering machine, because I choke up. I mean, when the first time I saw Ava. And then she listened to the answering machine again. Over and over. Those words, you know, I'll say the words I should have said to you. Wait, I'll admit, the first time I saw the show, I cried mm -hmm. really hard at that scene. But there's another thing you might miss is uh, when he, you know, the, the pill that goes on there. Yes, and mm -hmm. they reference that multiple times. But anyway, that scene is so powerful. And it's not just her reaction and how visceral it is, but... The fact that it's also so important to the show because she, you're watching the show, you feel like shit. You feel terrible. You're incredibly, incredibly, you, it's awkward and difficult to watch someone in the depths of so much anguish and despair. And yet, so that they're, they're not even, you know, they're acting totally whack like a person does. But at the same time, now it cuts to Shinji and he hears this. And there's that scene where he op he sees, he opens his door and he sees her there and he hears her. And he's like you now. You are him. You identify with him. You are observing this. And he cannot deal with it any better than you can. And he does not go to say anything. And he just, he turns away from it. And he, he can't even muster any amount of sympathy. Like, he can't do anything for her. He's so separate and cut off from her. And that scene... Really, that scene kind of encapsulates, encapsulates everything that Ava was really about. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of shows, you know, more shallow shows, you know, and that's just what they are is more shallow shows, right? It's people have predictable, you know, simple emotional response to things. Someone dies, we all cry. You know, we win, we all cheer. And some shows right? really manipulate, like Full Metal Alchemist, when they killed a certain character, really just manipulated you and milked it, but... It didn't really mean that much in the in the wider scheme of the show. You know, it was just a sad scene to make you yeah. feel bad. But the thing is, in the real world with real people, you know, emotions aren't that simple. People are fucked the fuck up and they do weird shit and they act in completely irrational and screwed up ways. And, you know, it, it things are a lot more complex than that. And, I just think Ava does, just, you know, having the, you know, only like, you know, a range of like, you know, six different distinct emotions and then each one, you know, like worried, angry, you know, sad. No, th things are a lot weirder than that. And Ava actually, you know, I guess people in Ava are a little more crazy, but it's the end of the world. What do you expect? See, at the same time, though, they really aren't in a lot of ways because they really kind of encapsulate the fundamental ideas and problems that all humans face. The thing is, because I mean, humans can deal with these problems, much like in the show. Notice how people, the characters are dealing with these problems partly because there are a lot of other people around. As the show goes on, there aren't as many people around, which means there is less there are less places they can go to hide from their own emotions. There are less ways people can distract themselves from what's going on inside of themselves. Yeah, no one's making, uh, you know, TV shows at the end of the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think there's a TV show that's on sort of earlier in the show you can see on some of the screens. But later on, you know, what Shinji's got like his Walkman. That's, that's about it. Notice how he <laughs> listens to the same couple of songs over and over and over again. And they really use that that. The, the, the scene, the idea that he'll just keep looping the tape over and over and over again. It's just like one of his final refuges from himself. Yeah. There's, but there's anyway, I mean, the point of all this is that the show does not just have all these amazing ideas and all these really well put together thoughts, but that it expresses them in an incredibly deep and well put together way. And that the show, from a technical perspective and from a kind of look at it, like how does it present its message is beautiful and amazing, and I can't imagine 
someone like just not getting it or not feeling it or not understanding the emotion and how well it's put together. Yeah, and that's not even counting the fact that, you know, the animation quality was a million times better than anything else at the time. And the animation than stands up even better today. Better than things today. You know, the sound quality was better than things. Everything about the production of it was better than the vast majority of anime productions, discounting only things like Satoshi Kon, Miyazaki movies, Akira, etc. But of course, the real, and I don't want to talk about this forever because we've gone on for a while, and partly I just, I want to express, that, you know, without having to worry about spoilers, how good of a show I think this is and how meaningful it is, but what was the show really about? Because remember, <laughs> this show very famously starts out as a robot show, does 24 episodes, sits you down and says, all right, not going to show you what happened. Doesn't matter. Here's what I want you. And I really, honestly, I'll say this again. I just a few hours ago watched the last two episodes of Shinseki Evangelion again. Now, I watched them a few weeks ago pre-packed, so I don't have them as quite as clear in the mind, but they're, they're clear enough. People who say those episodes were a cop-out or who say that, you know, the show, it was just a total, you know, cop out. They could have done it better. You're wrong. It is my opinion that you're wrong. Those episodes, I'm honestly going to say this, and they're not pretentious. They're brilliant. Yeah. Well, first of all, right, uh, my memory before rewatching the show was that those episodes were like, you know, the show was normal and then suddenly existential and weird. That's not true at all. The show gradually led into that very, very well. You know, they have that whole part where it's like you'll see like a vertical line squiggling and someone will talk, then a horizontal squiggly line and someone else will talk, then like the square and someone else will talk. Or right? the whole analogy where Shinji is free. What is freedom? Oh, they I have full did perfect that. freedom. I if don't know what to do. If you go back, you know, to episode, you know, 15 and forward, they do all that shtick more and more and more as the show goes on. You know, there's less and less just watching what's happening and more and more of that weird stuff. And then at the end, they just do full on weirdness. Well, plus the pace of the show gets more and more frantic. Escaflone did this very well, too. And then towards the end of the show, like the focus narrows and the focus narrows, not just as a show, but... In the characters' minds, in your minds, and everywhere. And it gets up to this feverish, pa feverish pace of, we are fighting the angels because we don't want the end of the world to happen. And then, at the end of the 24th episode, they, st you know, they did it. They did it. They stopped the last angel. It's over. They won. Now what? And you realize that the show's focus has narrowed. And everyone, you know, what's Asuka's deal? I'm nothing without Ava. What's Shinji? I'm nothing. Corollary, I'm nothing without Ava. Every, everyone in the show, the only characters left, there was nothing left for them but Ava, but fighting, but fighting the angels. Yeah, early on in the show, they these people actually have a lot going on, you know, in their lives. You know, they got school, they got, you know, work, they got stuff, you know, going, you know, they're going out to dinner, you know, all kinds of stuff. Later in the show, they got nothing except saving the world. That's it. And All the think rest about of the this. time, whenever you see a character, if they're not actively, you know, fighting an angel off, they're sitting around going, do, 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 I'm the, bored. The so, but no, the, 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 the technical aspect of this, the reason this works and the reason I say the end is not a cop out, but brilliant is that there was really no other way to end that show. And it follows right along with the previous episodes. It's basically the show did end in episode 24. The plot ended. And the show had gotten you to the point where there was no more plot. There was no more possibility of plot. There was no more possibility of moving forward for any character in that show or for the show or for you as a viewer. And thus you think, what now? And I think the show did such a beautiful job of doing that. I mean, I don't want to sit and you know go step by step through the last two episodes, but it's brilliant. They just sit the characters down and ask them, why did you do this? We have come this far. You saved the world. Why? And they would say why. And then they would ask the same question, very Socratic. You know, why do you pilot Ava? Because I want to. Why do you pilot Ava? Because I want to. Why do you pilot Ava? Because, because people tell me to. Why do you pilot Ava? I don't know. And it's like all these characters being forced to, I, to realize what they are because humans lie to themselves all the time. And I've seen very little literature Movies, books, films, anything.
that does such a good job of driving that point into your head so well and so subtly and yet at the same time so it's not up. subtle no it's subtle <laughs> but it's not it's subtle in that most people watching you don't realize what it's trying to make you admit what it's really trying to make the characters admit but at the same time it's being very blunt about it what do you want? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? I know, but I won't admit it. What do you want? The greatest part that I think is the beginning of episode 26, I believe, if I remember correctly. They're like, he, he pretty much comes out and says in plain English, all right, look, I, I, I wish I had the exact subtitles to, to, to just read out loud. He's like, we want to explore this idea and answer this question, right? But we don't have time to answer this question for all the characters. So we're just going to look at Shinji. It he just says that. That's what the, the the narrator says that at the beginning of episode twenty six. Yes, and, and also, people are confused about what the episode is about. He just told you in plain English. Oh my gosh! And then they do it, and then the show's over. And I mean, really, the show deals with a lot of fundamental philosophical issues. And you know, what are, what am I? And you think you know? What are you? What think? Ask yourself this question. What are you? And this, you know, all the ideas of solipsism and what is the soul and what is the mind and what, what am I and what are other people and what do I exist for? And these are questions that a lot of people don't deal with very well. They avoid when they think about it. And the show, Ava, does an incredibly good job, I think, of addressing these issues in an intellectual and philosophical way. And also in a clever and accessible way. Mm. I think the show says what it says incredibly well. Oh, here, here. I got. I found the script online real quick. You ready? This is what the narrator says at the beginning of episode 26. You ready? If this isn't plain English and not weird, I don't know what is. It was 2016 AD. That's not hard to understand. The thing that people lost, in other words, the, complimentation, the <laughs> complementation of the mind has begun. Uh, instrumentality. Right. However, there is not enough time to describe the entire process. We've only got like a 20-minute episode here. We can't show you every single soul on all of Earth combining into one pile of yellow goop. No, at the same time, for anyone who says those episodes are crap cop-outs because of no budget, watching those episodes again, I want to point out that while all this is going on, he shows you Misato dead, shot. She was shot and she is dead. It shows Ritsuko shot, dead. And then it immediately shows Ritsuko and Misato talking to each other. Yep. Then, wait, I'm not done yet. Therefore, we will examine the complementation, right, the instrumentality of the mind of a single boy named Ikari Shinji. So what he's telling you here is it, it, I, it couldn't be more plain. Every mind on Earth combined into one which right. was the instrumentality project. Right, so that's that six billion plus. I don't know how many people were alive in the year 2016 when the room of golf was empty. Right, uh, every single soul and all of the entire Earth went through an experience of combining into one. Right, and in order to tell the complete story, we would have to tell you all six or seven billion stories of every single thing that all those souls felt and went through. But we can't do that and look in a 20-minute TV show. And look at all the, like, glimpses mm -hmm. that it gives you. Yep. So we're just going to show you what happened to Shinji during this process. And that way you'll get a better understanding of it. Because you know what? If we actually just had a camera looking at the world, all you would see was a big pile of yellow goop that you saw in the movies and you don't know anything that's going on. Because there's no characters. It's a big pile of yellow slime. But, I mean, and, and look, like, they give you glimpses like that... That amazing scene and the amazing voice acting where Misato, you know, the the whole idea of the hedgehog's dilemma and the AT field. And then, you know, in, in the near the end of the show, when you find out what the AT field really is, you know, the boundary between people, the reason we have the hedgehog's dilemma, the fact that solipsistically no human being can ever share truly what they are with other human beings, all that blah, 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 blah. Misa it shows Misato desperately not wanting other people to see what was really in her heart. And just horrified and afraid and crying and screaming because Shinji and Kenji and Fujitsuki and, and every single person in the world, her father, are seeing everything that she is. There are no secrets. It's kind of like a god looking down on a two-dimensional world. I mean, think about that. Think about what instrumentality is. The whole show is people 
unable to deal with each other. People who, because they cannot share the solipsistic nature of their own heart and soul with other people, are fundamentally isolated from each other by the AT fields, by humanity, by the fact that we are individual souls. The fact that everyone in the world now has no secrets and everyone is one soul and nothing is sacred, nothing is hidden. That is frightening and horrifying and that is what people are going through in the end of Ava. That is kind of the literal truth of what is happening. Instrumentality succeeded. There it goes. Yeah. I mean, you have these people who are so emotionally <laughs> fucked up because they won't even, like, you know, talk to each other openly and honestly because they don't want anyone to know what they're really like on the inside. So they're all putting on a show. You know, Asuka's putting on a show, you know, of being all strong and cool, but really. She's not, and she's crying about her, you know, bitch mom and whatnot, but she acts all happy and bratty all the time, and, you know, it, 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 that the whole show is just all the characters act like that, but then it's actually literal. There's actually this field, and we actually destroy all those fields, and now you have to. Ha, and, ha, ha. And people, and, you know, one of the, I mean, I could go on forever about, like, what the end of Ava means and solipsism and humanity, but... The criticism I hear most about the end of Evangelion is people will say, it's pretentious, it's a cop-out, and it doesn't say anything that hasn't said before. And you know what? Very little that has ever been written or shown says something that no one's ever said before. You don't tell me that your Gurren Lagan or your Cowboy Bebop said something unique and special, but Ava's just saying things people said before. Yeah, we're, I mean, think about it. Pretty much every idea that there is to have was thought up by, you know, philosophers in Greece and such a so, long time ago. But anyway, that ago. argument is bullshit. Yeah. But second to that, the argument, the unstated argument, the begged question is that Ava does not say it well. And you know what? I'm not going to mince words. You're wrong. Ava says this more eloquently than most have. And more repetitively. It says everything it says multiple times. And it says it with such artistic grace and with such style. And I got to admit, I will put the end of Ava. And when I say the end, I mean the clapping. The, suddenly, the, notice how the music in the background slowly fades in. And it's, you know, the opening theme. Cruel Angel's Thesis. Well, it's a piano version, right? Yes, but yeah. it is that theme. And you know the lyrics. You've seen that opener 26 times. Man, that, you know, that song is a song I've heard a billion times in my life. Like a billion, right? And they play it all the time at anime conventions and social nights and all sorts of things, right? And, you know, it's a good song, but I got tired of it after a while. And it didn't really have anything for me, right? When I started watching the show again, I would actually watch the opener, <laughs> Because, you know, it's a good song, and I, you know, and even though I heard it a million times and it was getting a little old, that song fucking pumps you the fuck up. It's like, oh shit. And the thing is, Cruel Angel's thesis, watch out. This is a beautiful example of the show t making a point very, very artistically. I think those last few minutes of the last episode of Ava are some of the most well constructed and subtle moments in any show I've ever seen. And. I will say, I think the end of Ava, where the glass cracks and that music plays and every, you know, I'm at a toe, I'm at a toe, thank you, is right up there with the end of Cowboy Bebop. It's, it's amazing. Yep. Absolutely amazing. And think about all that's going on there. Shinji, he's brought to a head. And the moment he's brought to a head, he starts to talk. He starts to take form. You know, all the things that you see, all the imagery. The imagery is very important and means a lot. And then... The music starts playing, and the music is the opening scene. The, the music that you heard at the beginning of the show, the very first thing about Ava, that opening theme, you know the lyrics at this point. And now they're playing an instrumental version of the song, but they're playing it in a different manner from before. The instrumental version, notice how, despite the fact that the song is scary, there's a lot of major chords. It's a fairly upbeat melody. And now you hear the, and but when you see the opening, you know, the opener... It's set with this very, very disturbing imagery, and the lyrics are very, very deep and not at all what you expect from this upbeat song. But then, now that you know what the show was saying, you know what it's about, and you hear this in the background just before that glass cracks, the lyrics take on a whole different meaning, and the show does that thing of, it doesn't play the lyrics for you. It doesn't beat it and show you the lyrics and make you say, see what the lyrics are saying? It plays the song quietly in the background and you yourself think back and remember the song and you remember young boy who shines brighter than anyone else rise to become a legend and everything that that song was really about. 
And then that glass cracks. And once again, the first time I saw that, I, I got choked up. That is an amazing scene. Well, think about it, just the name of the song, right? Cruel Angels Thesis. That, that's what the show is. It's Cruel Angels and then a thesis. Boom. How could you be, right? Come on. Well, I think I had more analysis than that. Yeah. But- what you going to do? What you going to do? That's right. I'm going to say all my analysis. That's right. Mm-hmm. But I def- I mean, I basically, I'll put it this way. I hear a lot of people talk a lot of hate about Evangelion. I have never seen anyone put forth what I would consider an intelligent and backed up argument. Yeah. What is like, what do people say? They're like, oh, it was redentious. Uh, they don't actually have any specific arguments to back that up. They'll just be like, they'll say something vague, right? Like, oh, it was trying to say all this stuff, but it was just uh, confusing and weird. Oh, it was just a crazy guy. Oh, it was just this. They don't actually specifically point out, well, you see, this in the show was, you know, bad for this and this reason. Because if you actually looked at the show, it's all good. It's not anything bad you can say. Now, well, if, maybe this side, it's not perfect. But. No, it's not perfect, but <laughs> nothing's perfect. But no. I'll say this. If you listen to this and it and you disagree with us, and it's been a while since you've seen Ava. Watch it again. Watch Ava again, because I feel a lot more positively about the show having watched it again. Partly because seeing it when you're young, I guess maturity makes the show make a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. Being older, being wiser, having lived longer makes the show a lot more poignant because you've lived a lot. You'll watch the show when you're 14, and I'm not like that. Violet and Robot's awesome. When you're 25, when you're 35, you know, you look back on your life while you're watching the show and you realize that while you can't identify with everything these kids do, you can identify to a very, very strong degree with a lot of the ideas that are presented in this show and a lot of the darkness and a lot of the feelings that the characters express and the ideas. And the show is incredibly poignant and amazing. And if you watch Ava again and you still think it's a bad show, I defy you to argue that point at all. Yeah. I mean, who I who has actually tried to say, I mean, some people have said they don't like it or whatever. Or they think it's, you know, way overhyped or something like that. And, you know, one, I are, think you're wrong. There, well, the show does, you know, the show a lot of ways, you know, is just a lot of people who are fans of it because they're fans of, you know, like Asuka and Rey again, and Hentai. The biggest and argument like I hear against Ava is arguments against fanboys about Ava. Not arguments against Ava, arguments against fanboys and their interpretations. Yep. Forget interpretations. Look at cinematography. Look at soundtrack. Look at message. Look at artistry. The show is so amazingly put together. I think this, there is a, a, a whole phenomenon of people who their opinion, uh, they can't separate their opinion of a work of art from the opinion of that work of art of others. So it's like they have, you know, Cowboy Bebop, but now suddenly Cowboy Bebop is popular, so it's no longer cool. Or there's Evangelion. Well, if it was just me and Evangelion and no one else in the world, I would love it. But you know what? Because there's a million perverted fanboys who want to see Naked Ray, I don't like Evangelion anymore. Well, that's 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 a, it's a bad way to be because so you're missing out. I'm going to state my opinion absolutely unambiguously and uh, argue all you will. I feel that Shinseki Evangelion stands out among art and among works of fiction and among television shows it stands apart as one of the greater television shows ever made straight up without any reservation or qualifications yeah what what all right, try to think of a better tv show it's 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 I, gonna be could, rough you could argue cowboy bebop it's close and I'm, you know, I'm, we're sticking to anime examples because it's Wednesday. We're talking about anime. Yeah, but even if I try to think of non-anime TV shows that are better, just in any genre, in any way, just overall quality score on that level. Like in terms of artistry, in terms of how well it's put to, put together, I put Ava, the show, in the same league as like The Godfather, which I think is one of the most perfect movies ever made. And it's definitely like number one or two movie is the, is the Godfather number one easily. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't think of a single show. So we're deep in this LCL. We're out here in these dangerous waters. I defy you. Rebut us. Really, I don't think you can. Yeah, and even if you hate all that shit, how could you not like robots punching aliens in the face? Uh, if No, because <laughs> the one thing that Ava does not do that Big O does so much better if there was ever a show that exemplified robots punching robots in the face, or nay, Anything punching anything in any capacity, 
Big O is number one. It is the king of the genre of something punching something. Yeah, that, that I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm saying Ava has plenty of punches to satisfy the punch likers. The punch fan. Oh, and if you wanted to listen to the show expecting us to explain what Ava was about, we could. We kind of did a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, if we could go pretty straightforward because I think it's all pretty obvious. I'm not, we're not going to. All you had to do to know what Ava's about is to actually try to figure out what the characters want. Yes. Mostly, mostly what the bigger, more secretive characters want. Very simply, look at the show and think, what is Gendo after? What is Sele after? They're obviously after something. They're not just doing all this stuff for no reason, right? They what is to- Kaji after? Why did Sele do what they did? Why is Sele at odds with Gendo? Well, what did they do? Why? Yeah. Why did Gendo? Why did Gendo not want the spear to be there? Why was he at odds with Sele and vice versa? It's all pretty straightforward. And maybe someday we'll do a little like special, like a 10 minute. Here's exactly what happened and what Ava was about. But the show's not about that. The show is about why Ava is great. And you know what? It's great. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.